us for this day, God. We thank you so much that we get to be a part of all you're doing here at GCC, God. We're just so thankful for being able to open your word every week, God. We do thank you for the work you're doing in our kids at GCC Live, God. We thank you for the work you're doing in our kids this morning. And God, we just thank you so much for this time. Prepare our hearts, Lord, um, to be open to what you have for us, God. Just I pray in your name that all distractions would leave this place, God. That we wouldn't be distracted from our week. That we wouldn't be distracted for what's to come or our to-do list or the things we want to get done today, God. But we would be able to sit in your presence and just hear from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, GCC. How are we doing this morning? Good. Good morning. It's great to be here. Man, I'm stoked to be with you guys this morning. Easter was incredible. I mean, wasn't it? It was so good. We had 172 people uh, come through one of our three uh, services on that morning, and then another like 40 plus people come on Good Friday. Uh, it was crazy to me that we haven't done any advertising, right, at all. Zero. Zero. And still people show up every single week, uh, but that's what we're all about, real and raw, right? Like we're just real and raw. So I want to give you guys an update, but also some vision of why we're doing what we're doing, because without vision of people, what? Perish. Perish. And so um, without keeping God's vision for GCC in the forefront, I believe we are in danger of becoming something we don't mean to be. We are so excited with what God's been doing and continues to do in our little community here. However, I believe if we don't stay focused on the mission, we will fall prey to growth and fall into a rut of conformity. You see, favor and popularity often end in tragedy unless the person receiving the favor and popularity is laser focused on who they are, right? We see this play out in, in Hollywood all the time. Well, who we are as a church not built on a production factor, not built on being hip and cool, right? Yeah. We're a people gathered around the person of Christ, enamored by his holy word, yeah. and our mission is to love God, love people, yeah. share the gospel, and what? Yeah. Make yeah. disciples. Yeah. To make disciples. We aren't going to push for the unbelievers. Just listen to me for a second. We're not going to push for the unreached, the outcasts, and the undesirables. Sounds harsh. Because we believe that when God's people, his sons and daughters, come together under the banner of Christ with his great commandment and great commission as their guide, then the outcome of that focus is unbelieving, unreached, outcast, undesirable people are reached, not by us inviting them to a church building, but us going out as the church and meeting them where they are. That's biblical. For too long, the contemporary Christian church has said, don't worry about your calling. Don't worry about your gifting. Just invite people to, to us, and we as the church staff will do it for you. You don't want to love people, that's okay. Just invite them to church, and we'll do it for you. You don't want to share the good news of Jesus with people because you're too afraid, you don't know enough. That's okay. Just invite them to church. We'll do it for you, right? Uh, you don't want to pray with people. You don't want to baptize people. You don't want to lead people to Jesus. That's okay. Just invite them to church, and we'll do it for you. That's not biblical, you guys. No. That's not what we see inside of, the, inside of God's word, right? And so you want to know what God's desire for his, for his people are? We need to look at his word. Look at what we've been talking about the last seven months. The Sunday gathering, the, the church meeting, is for God's people to come together, get some encouragement, Get some direction, get some power from on high, like we experienced in in worship this morning, and then go out and live it. Amen. To live it. My fear is that if we don't stay focused on what God had us launch from, we will be in danger of altering the course of where God has us going. I don't ever want to get into a multi-million dollar building project where we take the focus off of loving people and put it on to arguing about whether we want the outside lake to have a levy, right? System to raise and lower the baptismal tank, right? Like, I don't want to get into an argument about people whether we need a $75,000 fireplace in the foyer or not. I think the problem comes when we want to build a monument to the church name that then becomes a beacon to people who think when they walk through the doors of a church, they've arrived. Like, oh wow, this must be it, this is it. It's the culmination of the gospel and God's goodness. 
Look at what we built and done, and let's just sit around and talk about it. I'll tell you right now, that isn't it. That isn't it. Church isn't the four walls, but it's the people. Amen. This is a gathering meant to stir up our affections for Jesus. Yeah. This is a gathering meant to stir up our affections for one another. Meant to stir up our affections for those lost and broken in the world around us. This is a time meant to stir in us a fire and an affection for Jesus that, can't cont that we cannot contain when we leave this place. We just have to tell people about it. Look at what he's done in my life. I can't help but proclaim him yeah. outside these walls. Yeah. Look at what he's doing. You want to be a part of this community because of what God is doing. Right. That's gospel community. That We aren't a church name, but a gathering of God's people so in love with Jesus and his word that we actually do what he says to do. Yeah. Amen. That's who we are. Why aren't we pushing for a better sound system? A better projection LED wall? A nicer venue or facility? Because we believe we have everything we need right here to do what Jesus has told us we should do. Plus, I come from San Bernardino, and I think we need a little ghetto in our lives to remind us where we come from, okay? And now what he's calling us to. Being a Christian isn't about lights and a show. It's about loving God and loving people. It's about, it's about sharing the good news of what he's done in you and leading other people on the journey of faith. That's discipleship. Amen. That's who we are. If you want some of these other things, that's okay. We bless you. We bless you when you come. We bless you when you go. That's all right. We love those places too. There are some, about a dozen or so options in a 20 mile radius of incredible churches that you can get all these things. Nicer buildings, bigger children's ministries, better speakers, better seats for your butts, right? Like, <laughs> but as for the rest of us, GCC, this is who we are, and this is who we're becoming. Too harsh? Okay, good. So I'm, I'm just getting fired up right now. With that, I want to update you on a couple different options for our church. One, this building is actually a restaurant, believe it or not. And uh, eventually, hopefully, prayerfully, they want to open it back up as a restaurant this year. So they've been you know, looking and talking about that. And so we love Mike and Debbie Schwinn, who let us use the building. Um, and so we're in that, pursuing a couple other options for places to meet. Almost all of which are here in Oakland. We'd love to stay here permanently if we could, uh, but ultimately, as I just said, <laughs> we can literally meet anywhere and accomplish the goal that Christ has set before us. So our eyes and our ears are open, and we're actively looking for a larger venue to be able to accommodate us and we can grow, but not change who we are, you feel me, right? Mm -hmm. We've been in talks and communication with Mike and Debbie, the owners here, and I've uh, been talking to them about a, a possible metal barn that we can build here on site. That would obviously be a couple years out. Uh, we've also been talking with Oakland Christian Conference Center and Pilgrim Pines, which is just right up the road from here. And uh, we're also pursuing relationships with other churches and uh, schools within our area. So just here's what we ask. Please be praying for us, okay? Be praying for us that God would open the right doors and that we would hear his voice clearly. Obviously, we make our plans, but God, he directs our steps, and we want God to direct our steps in this. So this morning... We're going to dive into our new uh, uh, series through the book of Ephesians and look at how, as the people of God, he is calling us to participate in his kingdom work in this next season of our lives. We'll cover all six chapters and 155 verses in order and in their entirety. Uh, some call the book of Ephesians the, the crown of Paul's writing to the churches. But as we'll see when we dive into it, it's also directly tied to the book of Colossians, which we just finished as a, as a series. Ephesians, however, is an expanded and more in-depth view of similar issues. It's a book of theology, as we'll see. What, what we can know of the nature of God. It's our beliefs as a people and what we know to be true of who God is. So it's supposed to be how we live our lives, right? So this morning we'll be in chapter 1, verse 1. But before we do that, would you pray with me as we open this holy word? Lord Jesus, God, we come before you humbly as your sons and as your daughters. We ask that your will would be done in our lives. We need you, Lord, now more than ever. As things around us politically heat up and as neighbors begin to hate one another even more, Lord, and as we see the love of many growing cold, we know that you are firing us up to be your hands and feet in the places that you send us. And so, God, would you give us your spirit to understand who you are? Would you give us your spirit to understand who we are? 
And would you give us your spirit to, to live out what you've called us to do? God, I pray this morning that you would give us ears to hear your word, that you would open up, take away distractions, you would open up our minds to understand your word, and open up our hearts, God, our souls, to accept everything that you have for us. We pray that you'd be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One of our main blind spots as a contemporary American church as a whole has been to overlook the central importance of the church. We generally tend to focus on, on individual salvation without moving on to the saved community itself. This is what we see in our world and in our, in our church culture today. Here's how to get saved, right? But then what? We highlight that Christ died for us to redeem us from all iniquity, which is true. But what about the fact that Jesus said he came to purify for himself a people of his own? Titus 2.14, it says this. Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, he says this, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We think of ourselves more as Christians than as the church. And our message is more good news of a new life than that of a new society in Christ. Does God give us a new life? Yeah. Yes. But he also gives us a new community, doesn't he? He gives us family within him, this bond that, that cannot be shaken by anything. He gave himself for us to redeem us and to, and to purify unto himself a people that is a body of believers, his children, that are his very own, who are eager to do what is good. That's what the book of Ephesians is going to show us. You can't get to the end of Ephesians with an individual salvation-focused gospel mindset. Ephesians is the gospel of the church. It sets out God's eternal purpose to create through Jesus a new society which stands out in bright, dazzling display against the dark background of the old world. For God's new society, his family, is characterized by life in place of death, by unity and reconciliation in place of division and alienation. Does this sound like our world today? <laughs> by love and peace in place of hatred and strife. Paul never loses sight of the goal when he wrote to the Ephesians and to us, which was to present the purpose and plan of God so clearly so as to motivate the church to live in a way that will forward the purpose of the church while they are here on earth. Here's who we are in Christ. Because of Christ, for Christ, now go out and do it. That's the beauty of this epistle. An epistle is a letter, not to an individual, but to a broader audience like a church within a city. So Ephesians, like Colossians, will point us to who Jesus is and then what our response to that should be. And in this book, we see a pact with theology. That is the systematic study of the nature of God. So let's dive in. Chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus... By the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul begins with a very common greeting to the church. Hey church, it's me, Paul, the apostle, which means sent one. This is Paul sent by Jesus for the will and plan of God. This is a big statement because it was someone sent specifically by God as his mouthpiece. It was an ordination, right? How many of you guys have heard the term ordination? You ordain a pastor, right? Like it's ordination, right? This is who I am, but not by self-appointment, but by God's appointment. You see, church ordination is simply the recognition of God's gifting on someone. Yeah. The church doesn't gift people. God does. And we ordain and we say, yes, we see that, God, that God's gift is on you. It was Paul's way of separating himself from the normal class of believers in the church. It's someone set apart for a specific work within the church. Now, Ephesians wasn't to a certain person, like I said, but this letter was meant to be circulated throughout the region, which is not, why it's not addressed to specific people like we see Paul do in other letters. It's just, hey, me, the apostle to the church, broad stroke. Paul goes on and says this. Then he says, God's holy people. To God's holy people. In other translation, it, it says to the saints in Ephesus. We got into this a little bit on Easter, but in the Bible, we never see God refer to his people as sinners, ever, right. ever. He doesn't refer to us as our faults and our failures. People outside of the church, sinners. Those that are redeemed by Jesus, he never says you are a sinner. He doesn't ever refer to us as our faults or failures. 
Paul didn't say, hey, heathens, sinners, filthy rags, right? Like, he says, hey, saints. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Now, does he say we sin? Yes. yes. Does he say we fall short? Yes. yes. But he never says that, what, that that's what defines us. You see, we aren't defined by our sin. What defines us, and us meaning those who believe in Jesus, what defines us isn't our sin, but rather our standing before God. Amen. When he looks at us in Christ, he says, saints, holy people, those set apart from the rest of the world. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Yeah. Why? Again, we saw this last week with the Easter story, not because we deserve it, but because Jesus already paid the price for it on the cross. Calling us sinners after Jesus died for our sins is to put him back on the cross once again. He defeated it forever. He defeated it forever. Being a saint is not a matter of achievement on our part. In Romans and Corinthians, we see the same term, saints, or those who are made holy because of Jesus. It's his work, not ours. He made us alive when we were dead in sins. His word went out penetrated into our hearts, it wakes us up from the dead. It stirred our affections for him, and then we responded to that calling. It says to the saints, the holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ. Yes, Jesus did the work. Yes, Jesus does the work, but he still asks for our faithfulness. He says, come and follow me. Come do the good work like we saw in Titus 2. The faithful people, meaning the loyal, constant, true, devoted followers. Paul says, grace and peace to you from our God and Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus is to be someone devoted to him. When you are devoted to Jesus, you follow him. You do what he says. That's our marker as, as Christians. Are you listening to Jesus? And doing what he says. There's a lot of people that listen, but they don't do. There's a marker there. Paul started by establishing his authority and then speaks of our authority. You see, to those who believe, we, be, we have become the righteousness of God. His spirit dwells within us. And we are what the Bible describes as the temple of the Holy Spirit. His very presence living within us. Saints. Now, does that mean we aren't going to struggle our sin? Every single day, we're bombarded by sinful thoughts and desires, aren't we? Yeah. And we think because of those sinful thoughts and actions that God is now somehow mad at us and won't take us back in. Anyone else think that way? <laughs> Just me. Great. <laughs> awesome. I think this way all the time, right? Like, but the truth of God is that he so loved us. His word says that he so loved us. That he sent his one and only son to die for our sins. All of them. Not just some of them. All of them. He knew we couldn't do it. He said, we've all fallen short. You've all fallen short. But it's not a condemning word. It's reality. But God, being rich in mercy and love, made a way for us to be made holy, called saints, because of his sacrifice. To all who believe. To all who did receive him. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Aren't you glad that we serve a loving God this morning? Amen. The enemy calls us by our sin. He calls us by our shame. He makes accusations against us. But you know what God calls you? He says, my son, my daughter, saint, holy, chosen, blameless, forgiven, righteous. Verse 3, Ephesians 1. I know we're just getting started. <laughs> Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, verse 5, he predestined us, don't worry, we'll get there, for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. We see lots of stuff packed into these couple verses. Paul in Ephesians doesn't pull any punches, and he doesn't even take a break in between truths. It's like an MMA fighter just going blow after blow after blow without even getting tired. This is Paul in Ephesians, okay? 
It's like, it's like drinking water from a fire hose. He's like, you ready? I know you're not. Here you go, right? It's like, it's crazy. He says, grace and peace to us in verse 2, but praise be to God and Father in verse 3. Grace and peace to us, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who is all honor and praise due? It's due to God, isn't it? Everything in your life is a gift from God. Everything. But only if it's good, though, right? No. <laughs> Wrong. Everything in the life of a believer is for your benefit and his glory. Pain. Your benefit, his glory. Suffering. Your benefit, his glory. Trials. Your benefit, his glory. How can this be? You see, God is sovereign. Meaning, in it all, he is in it all, above it all, he is about it all for the life of the believer. Our lives need to be a praise center for God. My car broke down. Not literally, I'm just saying, but I just figured it. My car broke down. Praise be to God that I had a car to break down. Amen. Oh, come on, Pastor Mark. <laughs> well, praise be to God that he's given me people to interact with on his behalf because of this car breaking down. Keeping praise of God always in front of us gives us the right perspective in every situation to stay focused and kingdom oriented when we get into the place of grumbling and whining to be honest like I've been this last week over some stuff in my life it distracts us from being present in the moment and glorifying God and everything Paul says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praise puts the focus off of us and back on to God where it belongs what we also see here is the formation of the Holy Trinity God the Father, God the Son, and as we'll see in verse 13, God the Holy Spirit. Paul says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So who has blessed us? Jesus, for sure, right? But commissioned by who? God the Father. It's a distinct separation that we need to understand. We believe in what's called the Godhead. It's not a term or a word we find very common in our day, and it's more rightly breaks down in Scripture as Godhood, meaning the character of God. But as Christians, one of our core doctrines is that we believe in the Trinity, God existing in three distinct characters, but still only one God. While the term Trinity doesn't appear in Scripture either, the Trinitarian structure appears throughout the whole New Testament Amen. of the Bible to affirm that God himself, the Father, is manifested through Jesus Christ, the Son, and now by means of his Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen. People have said that the Trinity is like, is like an apple. You know, they, they try to describe, you try to describe the Trinity, and people well, it's like an apple. God, the Father, is like the skin of an apple because he brings it all together. God the Son is like the flesh or meat of the apple because he took on flesh to come to earth. And then God the Spirit is like the seeds because he plants and waters our spiritual growth. Three distinct aspects, but still just one apple, right? But even in that, it's a bad example because an apple is a created thing. God is outside of time, space, and matter. He isn't bound to understanding like we are. He isn't created, but creator. To say God is like something here on earth is a bad depiction of God. It's not the right thinking because his ways are above our ways. He's outside of time, space, and matter. He created all of it. How he exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is called a conundrum. Can you say that word? <laughs> That's for the kids in the room. You're a kid at heart. You said it too. It's awesome. It's a difficult and confusing question. We know of the different characteristics and heart of God because we have his word. But no one has ever been able to rightly define the Trinity without bringing up other questions and issues with it because our minds are limited. One of my mentors in the faith had a solution for me when I was younger because this really bothered me. I want to know it. I want to I just let to, to define it. God can't be defined, right? He says this, listen. You have to major in the majors and minor in the minors. Meaning what is defined and understandable in the Bible? Major in those areas. When the Bible is unclear or not definitive in things, this is minor in those areas. People have fought long and hard battles arguing over the structure of the Trinity. How could God be three and yet one at the same time? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know the Bible says, for who is like the Lord our God? 
his ways above our ways, his thoughts above our thoughts. In Psalm 89, 6, it says, For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? Or Isaiah 40, verse 18, it says, With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? An apple? <laughs> Doesn't quite do it, right? In other words, he is above us. Aren't you glad? Amen. Aren't you glad he isn't bound to time, space, and matter like we are? That means that he can do whatever he wants. And what he wants is to love us through his son, Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 4, it says, For he chose us in him, that is in Jesus, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That doesn't make sense. But thank you, God. You've done it for us. It's the Father electing, choosing, predestining us, verses 4 to 6, the Son redeeming us, verses 7 to 12, and the Spirit of God sealing us, verses 13 and 14. Each section here concludes with the words, to the praise of his glory. To the praise of your glory, Lord. We don't believe in three separate gods. We believe in one God existing in three distinct ways. Amen. As our Father, as our Savior, and as our helper or power within the Holy Spirit. And to that, we praise his name this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the first part of God's character we see is the Father here, who is the source of every one of our spiritual blessings. Paul says, it is the Father who has blessed us, verse 3. He chose us, verse 4. And he predestined us to be his sons and daughters, verse 5. And who also freely has given us his grace, verse 6. It literally means and reads, grace with his grace. It's by the ultimate plan and will of the Father that he would send his own son down to earth to make a way, not out of anger, but out of love, so that you and I could be blessed in every spiritual blessing. And there are spiritual blessings in Christ. Hallelujah. God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We see the blessing of his son, the fact that he chose us and makes us holy and blameless, all of those things, choosing us, redeeming us, sealing us, setting us apart, are all spiritual blessings, things that the Father sees in us because of Jesus. But in this, we also see the heart of God himself. Where do all of our blessings and gifts come from? It's God the Father. What's his heart? His heart is to bless his children. Yeah. Did you hear me? So many times we get this wrong thinking of who God is, like he's this angry God, sitting on high, like throwing lightning bolts down at his kids because they messed up. No, no, he desires to bless his children. Now again, um, this, what this talks about, we're going to get into this in just a second. Paul said in verse 5, in love, God the Father predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus. Now, predestined is a word in the Greek that means that God determined beforehand. That's the definition in the Greek. He decided ahead of time who would be adopted as sons and daughters through his son, Jesus. Now, again, this is a word that many theologians, scholars, and Christians have fought over for centuries. There's been a long-standing debate, and Christian wars have been fought over this little word. In fact, because of this word, we have several differing forms of Christianity or denominations of the faith because of people's beliefs in it. Mm -hmm. To say that people are split about this word is an understatement, okay? <laughs> Some will say, who God predestined, those he chose beforehand can never be moved out of him. There is nothing you can do. It's already decided and there is no decision on your own. Once he decided who would be saved and who would not, that was it. It's a Calvinistic view, and they would say that salvation is only for a very select or elect few. Nothing that you can do about it. Now, that's true. It is for only elect few. We see in the scripture, we see wide is the road that leads to destruction, to hell, and many will go by it. And narrow is the path to heaven, and few will find it. But Calvinism takes it even further and says that those God has chosen will be saved no matter what they do. No choice on their own. And I've seen this in friends because I have guys on both sides, Armenian and then Calvinism. And I see the, the harm in both sides of these free will and then also just the five points of tulip. So we're not going to get into that this morning because we don't have time. But it says no matter what you do, you will be saved. It has nothing to do with us. We don't have a part in it at all. 
There's an obvious flaw in that thinking when you go either side, far left or far right, because throughout Scripture we see God giving his people a choice. Choose this day whom you will follow. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's a movement on our part. Amen. You have to choose that. We see it even in this chapter, a little on in verses 11 and 12. It talks about predestination as well. It says, in him we were also chosen, having pe been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. We who were the first to put our hope in Christ. Do we do that, or does he do it for us? What about in Romans 10, 9, where it says, If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Do we confess and believe, or does he do that for us? <laughs> Yet others will say, He predestined, predetermined, decided beforehand that he would choose all who would believe. Free will, choose all, I choose all. In his word, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord... It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Or we see in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So could it be that God predestined to send his son down to earth, that whosoever believes in him would be sealed? Elected, predetermined at that point to be saved? Amen. Perhaps. Here's what I know. We're going to major in the major, and we're going to minor in the minors. Amen. Meaning we are going to get caught up in fighting on what we want this to mean. Because ultimately people will say, this is what it means. But that's a belief. What do we know of what God said? There are major themes and doctrines in the scripture that are critical for salvation. And we hold those tightly. There are things that are not clear and really don't have salvation weight, and so we hold those things loosely. We as a church, we're going to hold on with a death-like grip to the knowledge that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Amen? Amen. That's critical for salvation. Amen. You want to know what I believe? People are going to say, well, Mike, what do you believe? I'll tell you. I believe that God's ways are above our ways. I believe what the Bible says. The Bible says we were dead in transgressions and sins apart from Jesus. All of us. We had no life, spiritually speaking. We were alive physically, but dead spiritually. I believe that by hearing his word, our spirits were awakened within us. Then it's by this still small voice of God that he calls us to repentance. He calls us back to himself. But we have to choose to surrender to that will or not. We have to choose that. Yes, Lord, I follow you. And once we do, once you choose, I'm going to surrender to you, Jesus. Once saved, always saved. When you surrender to him, he holds on to us, and not even Satan himself, the Bible says, can pluck us from his hands. Did God know ahead of time who would make that confession in step? Yep, absolutely. Does that mean he predestined it? Yep, it works. Does that mean I don't have to do anything now? I just get to, to sit and sail into eternal life? No. He still calls us to go out and proclaim his word. Amen. If we didn't have a choice, then why would he tell us that? The power is in the word, you guys. His word goes out, awakens dead hearts. They hear his voice. They respond. And he continues to do a work in them and through them. You see, when we say yes to God, he continues to do a work in us and through us for our entire life. Until we cross over from death into eternity. You see, we don't experience death like others experience death. We get to take part in what he's calling us to. Is it his plan? Yes. Do we get to take part in it? Yes. But only as we choose to. But what the heck do I know? It's just Pastor Mike. So, it's also important to note that it's in the first three chapters of Ephesians that we see all about what God has done for us. Not what we do. It's not until chapter four where he gets into what we get we now get to do. He says, therefore, right, in verse chapter 4, therefore, right, like we, we're not there yet. We need to understand the book as a whole and not just a part. It's within the whole gospel that we get the picture of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. You want to take a letter written by somebody and only read the first couple words and then say, I know the rest of the letter, right? You would read it in its entirety. 
It's the same with scriptures. We look at it in its entirety. This isn't about us. It's about what God has done. All right, verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption. This is important to understand. This is an important uh, theological point to, to understand as Christians. In him we have redemption through his blood. Now it's talking about Jesus, the son. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. Talking about the end times. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, in Jesus, we also were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. We see praise again. But again, it's all about God and us being united in Christ. What's important to understand moving forward? We won't get to heaven and say, I'm saved because I was united and tied to a church. <laughs> we won't get to heaven and say, I'm saved because I was united to a small group of other believers. We won't get to heaven and say, I'm saved because I did this or I did that. There is one thing of more importance than any other thing, and that is being united in Christ. I'm saved because I'm united to Jesus. In him, the fullness of the deity dwells, we saw in Colossians. In Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, I'm the only way. He says, sell all you have, pick up your cross and follow me. In other words, deny yourself, follow me. Let me have my way in you. In Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. In him, in Jesus, if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. It's only by and through Jesus you have redemption and forgiveness of sins. It came from the riches of God's grace which he lavished on us. Lavished is a word in the Greek that means abounding, never ending, never ceasing. It's this abounding grace, an overabundance. So much so that there's no end. It's an overflow. He pours into us, but not just to full. He overflows the cup. It also means riches, riches, gold, silver, fine stones. It's of more worth and an overabundance than all the treasures on earth. God's grace for us. That's how much he gives us. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you aren't who you once were. You've been made new, righteous, upright because of him. Are you united to Christ? Is he in you? Have you accepted him in you? Then you are a saint in him, in Jesus. We have redemption through his blood. Are you united to Christ this morning? In him we have forgiveness. In him we are made holy. That's the qualifier for us this morning, being in him. Everything hinges on us being united to Christ. Union with him, connection with him. In Jesus, when we are connected to him, we have an intercessor. Someone who is going between us and God. You see, he went between the chasm of sin and bridged the gap by his blood through the cross. He interceded for us stood between God and us, making a way for us to be connected to the Father. But also a closely related work to intercession that we see in the Bible is that of advocacy. <laughs> the two ideas overlap, but there's a slightly different nuance in the Greek of intercessor and advocate. Intercession has the idea of mediating between two parties, bringing them together. Advocacy is similar, but has the idea of aligning oneself with another. It's not enough for Jesus to just stand between us. An intercessor stands between two parties, but an advocate goes and he joins the one party on the other side, bringing the, the parties together. Jesus is not only our intercessor, but our advocate. And like intercession, advocacy is a ne neglected teaching in the church today. And it flows straight from the depths of Christ's very heart. John Bunyan wrote a book on Hebrews 7.25, the key text of Christ's heavenly intercession. But he also wrote one on John 2, 1, the key text for Christ's heavenly advocacy, which says this. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
period. No, he doesn't in there. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The New Testament message of grace is not morally indifferent. The gospel calls us to leave sin. John explicitly says, like, I write this letter so that you may not sin. And if that was the sole message of the letter, that would be valid and it would be an appropriate message. But it would crush us, wouldn't it? No more sin? What? Like, how, how can I do that? We need not only encouragement, but we need liberation. We, not, we need not only Christ as king, but Christ as friend. Not only over us, but next to us. When you, we are united in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins by his sacrifice. And in him, we have someone interceding on our behalf. And when the time and need arises, he not only intercedes between us, he stands on our side as an advocate. Here, take my arm. I will represent you as myself before the Father. Remember my son? Covered by my blood. That's the advocate that we have in Jesus. Not what we've done. It's him. Verse 9, Ephesians 1. It says, he made known to us the mystery. We're going to talk about this a little bit more next week. Of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, what's the mystery? Paul said, God makes known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. The plan of God, the plan of God for human nature, the plan of God for us, as the world, the, the, the created beings, is described as the mystery of his will. It's not apparent on the surface, but mystery is a significant term with regards to God's plan as his will, if not more. The Greek term mysterion occurs 28 times in the New Testament. Its connotation is not, as might be supposed, merely a mysterious secret, but rather God's great plan as it reveals it stage by stage throughout history to his people. We can know the mysteries of God. Do you have the spirit of God within you? You see, it shows that, that history is not a, a meaningless succession of events, but history perfectly planned by an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-understanding creator. He has a plan for your life. We can know the plan of God. Did you know that? It's through his word, by his spirit. We can know the plan. He has a plan for our lives. He has a plan in our local efforts. Right? He has a plan in the global world scene. We look at things and get worried about what's coming. He looks at it and is joyful because he's accomplishing his will, his plan. It's in his word that he's revealing to us the mystery of it all. And so what does it mean then that he says, I'm revealing the, the mystery until the times have reached their fulfillment? It's talking about the end times here. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week, but... Certain things have to happen in our world, in our society, in order for Jesus to return. It has to happen. We see his word. He prophesied about it and said, these things must happen. But rest assured, he's working those things out for our benefit and his glory. The mystery is revealed when we spend time in his word. Because of the Father's love in Jesus... By the power of the Holy Spirit, through his word, God shows us the mysteries of his plans. Some people will say, I have no idea what God is doing in my life. Sometimes God is calling us to wait, isn't he? Yeah. There's a few answers that God gives us. Yes, no, and not right now. <laughs> we don't like this about God. We just like, God, just show us so that I can get there. Just bring us to this ultimate you know, place. And he says, no, no, I need to work some stuff out in you first. Just wait. And sometimes it's the waiting that's the hardest part. Janine and I are in a season of waiting right now. And it's hard. But then when we stay focused on God, we understand that his plans are above ours. And we can trust him because he is good. Amen? Amen. Verse 13. We're going to jump down to verse 13 because we covered 11 and 12 earlier. It says, And you also were you included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Once saved, always saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Until that last person says yes to God, he says, I'm, I'm doing this work in you. He said you and you also were included in Christ 
when you, number one, heard the message of truth, and number two, when you believed. You were, you are, you're forevermore marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. In hearing the message of truth, in believing in him, we are sealed. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes through hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Faith, belief comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about who? Right. Jesus. Who are we? At Gospel Community, we believe in the word of God. We are those who love God, love people, share the good news with people, and make disciples. We speak the word because it's in the power, it's in it, that we receive the power of God to raise dead hearts up from the grave. Paul said, and you also were included in Christ when you heard and believed. It's not my job solely, I want you to get this, it's not my job solely to proclaim the words of Jesus. You too, when you heard and believed. We are marked, sealed, and guaranteed an inheritance. Are we doing this? This is who we are at Gospel Community. This is who we are becoming. That's what we get to do because we heard and believed. We hear his word. We believe in his son. We are at that moment sealed, covered, claimed by the Holy Spirit. Why would anyone want to deny his work in them? Why would any one of us want to say anything else? Because of God, we've been sanctified, set apart as saints. The Godhead in full display, each characteristic of God clearly seen in the life of the believer. Let me close with this. Our union with Christ is the secret to communion with him. Communion is intimacy and deep relationship. Our union with Christ is the secret to communion with him. How do we do that? By digging deeper into ourselves? By trying harder, harder on our own? No. His word says going deeper with him. We didn't come to salvation on our own. What makes us think that we'll come to sanctification on our own? Right? It's this, it's this ongoing work of God making us holy. And we think, I've received Jesus and now I have to do it. He says you couldn't do it on your own before. What makes you think you could do it on your own now? It's being unified, connected, our union with Christ. What makes you think that we'll do it? Sanctification is the process of becoming more like Jesus. We didn't come to him on our own power. We can't do it on our own power now. When we dive in with Jesus, we find depths to his grace that have no bottom. Or surely I'm going to mess up enough times and I'm going to hit the bottom of his grace. He says never. Never. When you don't read or pray or do something, you know, for God, we oftentimes feel like he's disappointed. Father standing with his arms crossed. <sighs> it's not God. But when we begin to understand his heart and his love for us, we see that his desire from the beginning of time has always been the same. He desires communion with us so much that he went to the extreme measures of sending his son in our place to get it. That's how much God desires close communion, close personal relationship with you. That what grieves him most is not our sin, but our refusing to believe that we can be in close personal relationship with him. The enemy wants us to believe that we can't be closely connected to God the Father. That what grieves the Father most is when someone believes they can't be close to him. It goes against everything that he's done. From the Garden of Eden to the deserts of Egypt, to God sending his son and the subsequent spirit, God's sole desire has been to be in close proximity and relationship to his people. His desire has always been to live in and among his people, to bless them, to mold them, to shape them, to grow them, and for them to declare the glory of him, the one true God and King. We've been given access to the Father because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, by means of the Holy Spirit this morning. All we have to do is surrender to it. We've heard the message. Do you believe? We've received the Spirit. Are you listening to him today? Are we living this out in our lives? I believe that we will see at GCC incredible 
God movements. Because it's not just me. It's not just Chris Stamper. It's not just our team that says, okay, we're going to lead. It's by us as the community of God gathering together, hearing from Jesus, and going in the same direction. Yeah. Because in that, we have great power. One is easily overtaken, but two can stand in the cord of three strands is not quickly broken. We are stronger together than we are separate. Yeah. Would you pray with us right now? Lord Jesus, God, we do need your direction for our lives. Your understanding of your word that we would be able to live righteously before you. And Lord, even when we mess up, we know that you intercede and that you are our advocate. That you stand between us and the Father, but not only stand between us, you bring us arm in arm to your Father. And so God, we've been made right because of you. So Jesus, I pray that in every way you would stir in us a, an affection for you. You would stir in us an affection for your word. You would stir in us an affection to be listeners. You would tune our ears to hear your spirit's word. Would you open our ears to hear your voice, God, in our life? In those moments when our car breaks down and you're putting us into close proximity with someone who needs to know you, God, would you open our ears to hear you in those moments? As you open up doors of opportunity for us to share your good news with those around us, God, would you give us great strength? Would you give us great encouragement? Would you give us great courage to speak your words? We know that you are living in us because your word says it. We know that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit because your word says it. We know that we stand before you as righteous, forgiven sons and daughters because your word tells us it's so. So Jesus, we surrender to you this morning. We ask that in every way, would you give us the encouragement that we need to go and live the life that you called us to from before time began. When you predestined us, when you chose us, when you elected us as your sons and daughters, that we would go out and share and do what you called us to do. So to you be the glory, the praise, and the honor this morning. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.